when we come to communion in just a short time, I believe that same spirit of praise and prayer and thanksgiving will still be upon us. And I want you to just feel free to really um, enter into that and to pray and to praise God. But I want to share a few thoughts with you from Luke chapter 2. If you're using the Bible, the church Bible, you will find it in the New Testament on page 1028. 1028. I'm going to read part of that chapter, first of all. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a censor should be taken of, taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they'd seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, while, which were just as they had been told. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angels had given him before he was conceived. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Spirit, Holy Spirit which, that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts, when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the fall and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be, spoke, that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. 
She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Israel. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was on him. I want to just share a few thoughts about waiting with you today because both Simeon and Anna and Anna were waiting. They were waiting for what God had promised them. And I know for many of us, we are too in a period of waiting. And I think there are just a few things I think God wants us to teach us to teach us today from this story. They were both waiting for Jesus, for the Messiah. Luke, the writer of this gospel, who was a doctor, was very precise in getting all the details correct in his account. Jesus was circumcised after the eighth day, fulfilling the Levitical law. Every Hebrew male was to be circumcised. The procedure set the Jewish people apart. Even though Jesus was born Hebrew by birth, he underwent circumcision to identify with his people. At that time, period of time he would also have his name um, registered and Mary and Joseph as we know were both told separately by angels that his name should be Jesus and when they went to the temple there they were Simeon and Anna in the right place at the right time one of the things I want us to learn about waiting from their story is this They were waiting with expectation. Do you sometimes, like me, occasionally wait? And actually, you're not really expecting anything to happen at all. You're just waiting. If anything, because sometimes we get discouraged, we're waiting, but we're not. We're actually expecting it all to fail. Sometimes we can be like that. But Anna and Simeon knew how to wait with expectation, and God wants us, you and me, to wait for him with expectation. Luke actually uses a Greek word when he talks about them waiting, and it says, according to Greek lexicons, that it literally means they were alert to his appearance and they were ready to welcome him. You know, it's almost like, you know, someone's coming, so you get your coat on ready. They were waiting with expectation. They weren't lolling about, maybe it will happen. It probably won't because nothing good ever happens to me. Some of you say that, don't you? And it really, those words should never come out of your mouth. Because if you belong to God, then you know that he has a good plan for you. Because it's not about you, it's about him. It's not about you not being good enough. It's about him being good enough and loving you with an outstanding love. In Luke chapter 2, Simeon was waiting with expectation. Anna was looking forward to Jesus, the Messiah, coming. And I believe that for, maybe it's only one or two people, I don't know, but I believe that for some here this morning, God would say to you, right, you've got to change your attitude, because I know you're waiting for a promise that I've given you, maybe. Or just for blessing. Well, you need to start waiting with expectation. And you need to start declaring that with your mouth. What has he called you to wait for? Simeon was waiting for comfort. It says in Luke 2.25, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon. He was righteous and he was devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. That's interesting, isn't it? While he was waiting, the Holy Spirit was upon him. And for us too, more so, Because we are those who are after the Holy Spirit came to baptize us. So we have the presence of God, the Holy Spirit, living in us if we already know Jesus. We 
don't have to wait in that sense for the Holy Spirit to come because he's already come and we're already filled. Whether we feel it has nothing to do with it. It's got nothing. It's, it's about time we stop living by our feelings. You know, I, I babble on so much about not worrying but I totally believe, because of my own experience, because I learned to worry as a little girl, I totally believe we can, by the grace of God and the power of his word, change our minds and renew our thinking. So don't bother to come to me and say, I can't help it. Because we can be, I know that you in yourself can't help it, like I in myself couldn't help it. But we can, by the power of God, be renewed. And we can expect God to move. Because he's a faithful God. He's the one person we can trust. I can tell you for sure, if you put your trust in people, then now and again, even the best of us fail, don't we? So for goodness sake, don't, don't think that this church is going anywhere because of anybody who leads it or anybody who does anything. Because it's about him. And we must keep our focus on him for goodness sake. Don't think it's all about a person because it's not about people. It's about him. Yeah, we come in obedience. Of course we do. But it's all about him. And so, Simeon was waiting for comfort. He was righteous, as we've heard. He was devout. He had a good relationship with God, but it wasn't easy. You see, that's another excuse we can use, isn't it? It's all very well you telling me to be expectant, but life is very difficult. Yes, I know it is. Lots of us have had a difficult year. I haven't had the best of years myself as far as practical things. I've just been through an horrendous time with mum. But do you know what? We have to be expectant that our God is fighting for us. I won't go into my story, but I could tell you time and time again where in the middle of it I said, God, I know that you're fighting for me. And I'm going to trust you and be expectant. But at this time they were under Roman rule. They'd lost their political independence. They were living in fear of a cruel and crafty King Herod. There was every reason to be discouraged. And I guess an awful lot of people around Simeon would have been discouraged people. Now Herod's in charge. Now Trump's in charge. <laughs> Do you know what? We're not putting our, our trust in a man, are we? We're putting our trust in God, the King of Kings. And the Lord of Lords, we do not need to be discouraged. God doesn't want us to be discouraged. There was every reason for Simeon to be discouraged because of the way things were around him. But he was not discouraged. In fact, he was sure of his hope. He knew that one of the popular titles for the Messiah of the day was Comforter. And he held on to that. You are my Comforter, God. And I'm trusting you. He believed that God had spoken to him by the Holy Spirit and God told him he would not die before he'd seen the Lord. And he took God at his promise. I want you to be encouraged today to hold on to the hope that you have. You know, maybe your, your family are far from God. Well, God would tell you to keep praying and to be expectant because he loves them more than you do. Don't let go of the hope, however long it takes. Waiting is okay. Lots of people in scripture had to wait. What are you struggling with today? Maybe you're struggling with loneliness and emptiness and desperation. We're increasingly beginning to um, help people who are struggling in our community. You know, who are desperate and lonely and broken. And we want to do that because Jesus is the answer. He looked at the baby Jesus and he said, Emmanuel, God is with us. God is with us. Isaiah 40 says this, Those who hope in the Lord will renew their 
strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will not walk and not be faint. If we can only put our hope in the Lord, not anywhere else. Psalm 34 says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. And God wants to be your comfort today. If you need comfort today, then when we take communion, I want you to focus on that this morning. And I want you to ask God to come and comfort you. Because he's promised to do that. Anna, she was waiting for forgiveness. Her husband had died. They'd not been to be- together very long. So she'd had a really tough life too. And she dedicated herself to fasting and praying in the temple. We could have done with her on the 24-hour prayer days, couldn't we? She was there day and night praying, fasting. And she spoke of the child. She was looking forward in verse 38 to the redemption of Jerusalem. Redemption was related very much to captivity. She was remembering the Passover story. Remember when Moses, God used Moses to go and speak to the Pharaoh in Egypt and God set the people free from their captivity because God sets people free. He really does. There is nothing too hard for him. He is our deliverer. In fact, the Greek word, the Greek translation for the name Jesus, which comes from the Hebrew name Joshua, means Jehovah is deliverer. And there's nothing too hard for God to deliver us from. He understands our condition. And maybe today you feel you are in captivity in some way. You are bound up. Well, God can set you free. And you may say, well, it's gone on for years. Well, then, then it's time for God to set you free. Because nothing is too hard for him. He is the answer. In Matthew 11, it says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So what are you waiting for? People had an expectation. Many, many people around had an expectation that the Messiah would come, but they were looking in the wrong places. They were looking to the, to the wealthy, to those who could afford lambs to sacrifice. But in Jerusalem, there was this small group of folk who were studying the scriptures and the prophecies in them And rather than advocate the overthrow of Rome, they met silently and prayed and lived lives of godliness. That's a word for the church today, isn't it? Rather than try and overthrow Trump or sort this out or sort that out, you see there's a a deeper thing going on, isn't there? What we need to do is seek the Lord and his face because he can do what no man can do. Nothing marked out Mary and Joseph as the parents of a Messiah. Nothing marked out the baby. He didn't have a golden halo around his head, although we do put them in nativity stories. In fact, the prophet said that he had no form or comeliness that would attract us to him. He was born in obscurity in Bethlehem. So you see, people were looking in the wrong places. But then in the temple, there was Simeon and there was Anna. Poor old faithful Simeon kept his eyes fixed on the promise. Anna from the tribe of Asher, a widow, an old lady. Don't put me on my soapbox again. Why would God be an old widow? Because he does. Supposedly an insignificant person heralded the birth of the Messiah and became an evangelist. He came to her in spite of her circumstances, 
in spite of her singleness, us single people have to stop feeling sorry for ourselves. It's not healthy. In spite of the corruption, it also makes you unattractive. But that's, there's another sermon in that. In spite of the corruption in the religious system, in spite of the tension in Rome, God used her anyway because she expected him to move and she put her hope in him. She had her eyes fixed on God. So I want to just quickly now share four things I want you to remember today and then Annette's going to come and the team are going to come and we're just going to worship God and we're going to seek God and you're going to give God all that troubles you and he's going to heal you and set you free. I would encourage you to do what Anna and Simeon did and make Jesus your focus today. Hebrews says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I want you to be expectant, because he who has promised is faithful. In Psalm 36, let me read to you a few verses from that it says how priceless is your unfailing love O god people take refuge in the shadow of your wings they feast in the abundance of your house you give them drink from the river of delights for with you is the fountain of life in you we see light and you know there's a chorus in lamentations isn't there I, i'm assuming lamentations was written before the chorus but you know the one i mean because of the lord's great love we are not consumed. This will not consume you because of, not because you're strong, because of the Lord's great love for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord. Great is thy faithfulness. I will say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. I won't say to myself, surely you're rubbish. Nothing good's ever going to happen to you. I will say to myself, the Lord is my portion. If we could get into that kind of habit, we would soon be transformed. Number three... Let God comfort you. Now, it's lovely to be comforted by one another, and there is a place, a biblical place for that. But Matthew 11, we've already said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And number four, wait patiently, expectantly, patiently. I love Psalm 27. It starts with this, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And then in verse 13, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord. Can you say that with me? I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Now say it with a bit more confidence. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Let's be like Anna and Simeon. And wait expectantly for the promises of God are yes. And by the way, there's a bit of good news. We know how the story ends. Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sin of many. And he will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Amen.